the chat. All right, Big Mac, are you with us? I'm with you, brother. All right, we are live. And um, so welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Drug and Alcohol with Tony's Facebook Live show. I am uh, super excited to have with me uh, a very special guest, Mr. McDonald Oden, former uh, Cleveland Brown. And um, we, <laughs> I'm going to laugh a little bit because we had a, a whole bunch of fun before before we came live getting the technology <laughs> live. But, you know... I guess where there's a will is a way. So you won't you won't be able to see see uh, Big Mac's handsome face. You'll have to deal with my ugly face. So you know probably probably hearts are probably breaking all over the country right now, Big Mac, because they they won't be able to see see the stunning uh, uh, stature of a man that you are. So they're gonna just have to be stuck with uh, with my ugly mug. I'll do it. I appreciate it, brother. <laughs> but I am I'm super glad that you uh, that you joined us. You know. Um, uh-huh. You know, it's it's really cool. So, you know, by way of background for the folks that are going to see this show, I I um I met I call, I'm going to call you Big Mac because that's what Randy calls you. Are you are you okay with that? Yes. I kind of like it. So I, I saw Big Mac speak at um, an event that was hosted by Transformations um, and our good our mutual friend Randy Grimes um, in Delray, and it was really um, a, a sort of symposium where they were uh, highlighting. You know, uh, former uh, you know retired professional athletes like McDonald, um, who have had to deal with the disease of addiction. And you know, I, to be honest, I was so moved by everybody that spoke. Um, I, you know, it, I'd like to get everybody on the show, but um, Big Mac and I connected, and he's got a great story. And so, I'm always honored and, and just flattered that you would you know take take some time to come and and chat with us and, and share your story. So thank thank you very very much, my friend. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it, buddy. No problem, my friend. So let's, you know, I always like to, to give everybody a little bit of background. Can you hear us, Audra? So, um, Big Mac, tell us tell us where you grow up. Uh, I grew up in a, a little town uh, called Spring Hill, Tennessee, which is about 40 miles uh, south of Nashville, Tennessee. Right. Uh, um, I, uh, just to give you a background as far as my siblings, uh, I... Uh, have three sisters and I had two brothers, but my oldest brother uh, passed away from uh, this disease about 20 years ago. Wow. So, uh, uh, and uh, my mother, uh, she passed away about 20 years also, but it was from a heart attack. So, she, uh, Mark, just to let you in on something, my, neither my father or mother drink, neither one of them. They drink, they didn't drink or do anything. They smoked a little cigarettes every now and then, but other than that, they didn't do anything. And uh, it just shows how cutting and baffling, baffling you know, uh, our disease is. Man. Yeah, so, it's 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 yeah. crazy stuff. So so tell us a yeah. little bit about because you know you 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 had you had um you said you had you had two brothers and and three sisters. So there were six of you. I mean, yes. that's a lot of kids in one in one house. What yes, did you, what did your parents do for work? Well, well, uh, uh, my father uh, was a sharecropper. I don't know if any of your guests know what a sharecropper is, but uh, just to give you an idea, a sharecropper is someone who works another man's crop, his farm for him. And when it comes time to sell a crop, uh, my father would only get a certain percentage of, of the money, but he's done all the work year round, seven days a week. And while the other guy uh, would sit in the house uh, and be able to spend time with his family. And quite honestly, quite honestly, I'll tell you, Mark, um, at a very young age, um, I just knew that there wasn't, something wasn't right about that. And um, my mind was made up then that um, I certainly wasn't going to do that. But but also, on the flip side, my father, we never went hungry. And I was proud of my father because he took care of his family. We right. never went without. So, so, so let me ask you, what, I mean... 
Is this is this in the time of the civil rights movement? Yes, it is. Yes, okay, yes, so yes, you know, yes, it was. I think that's important for people to know because you know, I mean, I didn't grow up in this country, but you know, I, you know, I when I went to college here, I certainly learned about about the civil rights movement. And when you start telling me about your dad being a sharecropper, I, I sort of have flashbacks to to the Oprah story about you know, and also there's a very famous lawyer here in Florida called Willie Gary, um, who yeah, also yeah, exactly. Grew, grew, exactly literally grew up you know with a dirt floor and uh, mm -hmm. with with parents that worked you know, literally work their fingers to the bone to provide for their children. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. when you understand that, you sort of, I mean, I always think well, I come from humble well, beginnings, but I think, you know, it pales in comparison well, to what well, you came from. Yeah, well, well, you know, what I would, would like to share with, with, with your listeners is, and I can remember as a child uh, uh, going to the center station and look at the door and it says, white men only. I couldn't go in. My father said, you can't go in there because they had white men only on the door. And, and talk about talk about unbelievable, and it was my first time ever seeing it. But yeah, it was unbelievable having to, having to deal with it. How how old were you then? I was I think about ten years old. Okay. Did did you ask your, your dad what that was all about? Like why why could you not go in and white yeah, people could? Yeah. What, yeah. what did he tell yeah, you? And he really his explanation was, well, you know what? That's just the way it is. That was just his explanation. That's just the way it is. Okay, yeah. so so I mean, obviously, we know that, and we're going to talk about about your beloved Cleveland Browns. I know how excited you are for this year, and we sort of chuckled when we spoke the other day about the Hard Knock Show, which we all got kind of excited about just watching it. But when you growing up, were you were you an athlete? You're a good athlete. I was a very good athlete, uh, and uh, I began playing um, high school football. Uh, my my sophomore year. Well, I went out my freshman year and I quit. I, Why? I didn't want to, Why? Because it was too, too hard. Okay. The coach was the coach was too hard. And I said I don't need this. So I quit. Okay. Came back my my sophomore year, and I was determined to stick it out. And uh, lo and behold, uh, starting from my sophomore year, I began getting uh, recognition as far as in the state and. Uh, as being uh, a top athlete in football and basketball. Uh, uh, and uh, during the senior year, I was rated as one of the best uh, players in the country. So we had a, had a little small town like Spring Hill. I was the first, first player in Spring Hill to ever get a, a scholarship what, in college. What, what, posi what position did you, did you play in high school? I, I, wide receiver. You're, a, you're wide receiver. So, so you yeah. must have been, you must have had speed. Oh, yeah. I, I was a uh, 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 about four five forty six. I was six five one ninety five running four five forty. Okay, so so you had a a great reach and you you could run great, like the great, wind. Exactly, great great reach. And you now uh, uh, I had a coach who told me run like you stole a government mule. That was one of his things. <laughs> okay, I like that. I yeah. like that. So did did you play any other sports? Basketball. Play basketball. basketball. I was a very good basketball player also. As, as a matter of fact, I had uh, several offers to play basketball in college also. Where, where did you get offers to play? Uh, basketball, I could um, – uh, Virginia uh, in basketball. Virginia, I went to um, – Richmond also. Richmond wanted me to come there. And also, uh, where was it? Uh, not Temple. Uh, David Lipscomb College. They, that, those were all around both areas. Wow. Okay. So, so I mean – how did you figure out? How did you say, well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna play college football as opposed to college basketball? How'd you How'd you make that decision? Um, it was just a, a feeling I had. I, I I felt even though I was a good basketball player, uh, football I, I I enjoyed the contact. You know, I'm a very aggressive guy. Okay. And, and I enjoyed uh, hitting and being hit. So. Uh, and as I said, I uh, received a lot of accolades. And after, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Big John Merrick, who was one of the winningest coaches in college football, he saw great potential in me and and, uh, and told me that I wasn't going anywhere except there with him. Okay. So, so I mean, at what, at what point during your high school career do you say, you know, uh, I'm going to go play college ball? Well, uh, Mark – I was going through my senior year. My junior year was when I, I had started to receive uh, all the letters from the different colleges, 
uh, you know, letting me know that they were watching me and that they were interested in me coming to the university. And uh, my senior year, uh, you know, it, it got even more um, entertaining because more and more schools got involved in going on college visit. And, um, you know, some schools wanted to do more for you. And uh, uh, I just told this Tennessee State over uh, over. I took over Alabama, Tennessee, University of Tennessee, uh, Florida, Memphis. I, I, there's five SEC schools that I could have gone to. Okay. And I, I mean, I, I, I want, I wanted to stay home. Tennessee State is a natural, and I wanted to stay home because that would allow my family to come see see me play every Saturday. I mean that that I mean that's some elite company. I mean you know I mean you know we think about Alabama and, and yeah. Tennessee. I mean these are especially Alabama. I mean we're talking about yeah. I yeah. mean the best to the best. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So yeah. is is this and, and help me understand the time frame a little bit here, uh, Big Mac. And I, I apologize, I'm a little ignorant on this stuff. So so help me out here. <laughs> um, is this because you know I remember I remember seeing an ESPN special where they talked about how at one time Alabama and I guess it was all the SEC schools were not integrated. And uh-huh. and um, the the coach at Alabama, uh, I guess the Bear, right? Bear Bryant, Bear Bryant yeah. reached out to his friend, uh, whose name I forget right now, who was the coach at USC, and said, "Hey, would you guys come down here and play us?" And so, of course, USC came in town, and they were, you know, they were an integrated team, uh-huh. and they came uh-huh. in and blew Alabama out at home. Uh-huh. And after that, uh-huh. you know, the fans who were, you know, rabid racists. Right, said, right. shit, we might need to get some of these African-American players because we're going to get exactly. our asses kicked every year, exactly. especially if we go out mm-hmm. west to play. So, mm-hmm. I mean, is, exactly. is this a time, is this a, around that time where schools were starting to integrate? Well, well, well you know, uh, schools, they were already integrated, but one of uh, the selling point that got me to go to Tennessee State was, was I, want, I wanted my parents, see, I... I was only about 50 miles uh, Nash, from Nashville to my parents' home. And I wanted my parents to be able to come to my game at every home game. You know, because if I if I were going to Alabama, Tennessee, or whatever, and see those schools are anywhere from two to three three uh, hours away, and, and my family could afford it. Right. They just could afford it. Whereas, whereas Coach Merrick, you know, he, he made sure they all had they had nice seats at every home game, okay? And he talked about my dad on TV at every at every Sunday morning. He would talk about my dad bringing him some country ham, rabbits and squirrels and things down there and giving them to him. So so my dad – Your father was a connoisseur, I can tell that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he got as much publicity as I did. I love it. Coach for bringing Coach Marion all the food he wanted to eat. I love it. Well, but, I mean, uh, but, 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 yeah, you, you know what, to tell you, you know, Mark, tell you the truth, man, I am, I, I had been in a, in, a, in a small community. I had dealt with racism, racism for so long, and I wanted to go to the all-black school. I really did. And, and, and Tennessee State was nationally ranked. You know, you couldn't get a better school. And, and I wanted to go there because they had a great tradition. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, so you go there now. Did you get, did you get how many how many years did you did you play there? Four. Okay. I, I, I was second freshman in TSU history to go start. Wow. So you started your freshman year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Played okay. four years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Now, uh, were you playing still playing as a receiver? Because you did you play yeah. receiver in the uh, NFL? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. I played tight tight end and wide receiver. Okay. Because the yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what, what was amazing me, and I, you know, I, I, I got exposed to, to college, well, to football late in life when I went to, to college here. Um, is the is the way this sort of each player seems like individually sized for the particular spot they're playing. So it's almost like a tight end is a is a slightly bigger receiver, but he's not quite maybe as big as an offensive lineman, right? Is that kind right, of what it is? Exactly. So you can kind of exactly. you can kind of eat your way from being a receiver to a tight end, and if you really eat a lot, you could probably eat your way into becoming an offensive lineman. But 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 you know. Now, Mark, the key to a good tight end is, see, a good tight end, if, he, if he's big, has speed and good hands. Right. So you've got to have the hands of a receiver but the blocking exactly. of a lineman. Is that exactly. kind of how it works? Or at least a fullback. And you got to have speed. Not bad for a guy who grew up in England playing soccer, right? I kind of got this stuff down. 
you, you got you got to have speed. You, you look at the guys like, uh, and, and I was just the example I played. So I played behind Ozzy Newsome. And Ozzy, the, the, depending on the formation we ran, uh, the tight end and the wide receiver exchange routes because both the, with the run, with the run against the ball. So you know, in certain offense, a tight end has to be able to run like a wide receiver. That, that's great. So I want to know, were, were you a good student? Did you go to school? Yes, I, you know, I went to school, but you know what? I tell you what, I did I didn't apply myself the way I should have, Mark, uh, because uh, I started messing around with the girls. It happens when you're an athlete, so I hear. Yeah, yeah, I started I started messing around with the girls, and Coach Merrick uh, got in my butt about uh, not going to class, and I, 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 I like about 38 hours of graduating. Say that, say that one more time. I lost you. I, I, I need about 38 hours, 38 hours to graduate. Okay. Did, yeah. did, did you enjoy going to class, or you just was like, I just want to play football? Oh, well, you, my, my, uh, my first couple of years, I really enjoyed it. And then as I, as I was there, my junior, senior year, I got introduced to the women. Okay. Yeah. And, and you talk about a little small town country boy, you know, and, and, and you're around, around pretty women from Chicago, uh, Detroit, all around. And I didn't see anything like this. So I used to take it for granted. And uh, as long as I played football and, and uh, the girls were there, I just said, heck, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sleep here today. And, and I, I neglected it. So, see, normally it takes five years to graduate, which I, I, I if I stayed that five years, I would have graduated, but I left it for work. Right. Did, did, did they have the red shirt back then? Did you, could you red shirt yes. back then? You still could do that, yeah. right? Okay. So, yeah. so you know, I, I want to know something, because you told us, you shared with us at the beginning of the show that you, know, you didn't grow up in a, in a family where they, they drank a lot. And my family was very similar, right? I, I mean, I'm not a drinker by choice, but, you know, uh, my, maybe that's because my parents didn't drink, but I have a sibling who likes to drink, and that's okay. So mm-hmm. we've had some guests on here who, uh, who who played ball who said that, you know, once they got into the college atmosphere, they started to get exposed to things like, you know, alcohol and drugs and steroids and right. things of that nature. And I'm wondering if back then when you were playing at Tennessee State, if that if any of those things were ever an issue. Well, uh, I, I got exposed to drinking and smoking marijuana. Okay. Uh, and while in college, it's an issue. Yes, uh, 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 but it wasn't um, to a point where I overdid it. Of course, after a game, I celebrated and everything. But uh, I took my uh, somehow I had crossed that line uh, between recreational and habitual, and huh. and and, uh, and quite honestly, you know, my idea of a, when, when when I heard the word drug addict, my idea was. I was uh, someone who had a needle in their arm or someone who was sleeping in an abandoned house, all those kind of things. Right. So, so go ahead. Go ahead so give us, an, give us an idea of, 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 you know, if you were smoking, how often that was. I mean, I, wanna, I, I smoked marijuana probably three times a week. Okay. Do, did, and, you, and, did you feel like it ever interfered with your ability to, you know, to no. practice or lift or whatever no. it was? No? No. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Were, were they doing drug testing back then? No. No drug testing? No. Okay. Not in, not in college, no. Okay. What about, you know, with, with steroids? I mean, did they, did they even have steroids back then? I don't know if they did they, or didn't. Well, yeah, they had steroids, but steroids was very hush-hush. People used it. I never uh, tried steroids, but people always kind of, who, who did do it, you know, it's kind of a, a very uh, secret code that that uh that kept amongst themselves right okay yeah. so so i mean it seems like at that point you know i mean it doesn't seem like and i, and I hate to minimize this because there's probably some people who, who are listening i know that some people have sort of vocalized to me that they feel like the marijuana is the gateway drug but we're talking about what in the in the 60s i mean i don't you think know, we're talking we're, about the same kind of stuff that we're se- talking about these days right right, right. yeah I, yeah i went to college in uh, 1976 okay so so uh, we're talking, and we, you know, we, we we're talking just everyday pot, not none of, none of the stuff they have today. And and I don't. And, and and first of all, if I had a chance to do it again, I certainly wouldn't even would would even, would even touch pot or drink if I had a chance to do it again. Right. Because I, and now certainly I'm at a point in my life I, I know what it leads up to, but uh, back then. 
I, I was certainly trying to uh, fit in with all the guys. Yeah, did, did, were, were all the guys on the team smoking weed and drinking? I'd say eighty percent of them were. Okay. All right. So, so were there, were there was there any because you know we're still in the times of the of the of the civil rights movement. So, is is there was there ever issues with any of the you know because obviously you had you had you know black players and white players and were there ever any issues or listen you guys were a team that's well, it. No, no. What what Tennessee State was a predominantly black college. Okay. So so but we had uh, I think three three white guys on the team and no they were all brothers man. They lived in a dorm with us, and everybody, we all got along. That's great. Yeah. I love it. We had, yeah, we had three three white guys on the, on the team, and, man, we had, everybody loved them, man. We, everybody got along with them. Yeah. So in, in the four years you played at Tennessee State, you ever get injured? I got injured a couple of times. Uh, yeah, uh, bruised thighs, uh, and I got a concussion one time. Okay. You had your battle yeah. run, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I've been training the martial arts for many years. I, you know when your bell has been rung. Yeah, exactly. you, you know, <laughs> you know. Until you've had your bell rung, you don't know what that term means. But once you've had your yeah. bell rung, yeah, you know what it means to have your bell rung. Exactly. Trust me. <laughs> um, so I understand what you're saying. So, uh, so, at what point did you say to yourself, "Wow, you know, I could actually make a living playing football. I could be a professional football player." When did, uh, that, when did you figure that well, out? When did you say, "Yeah, I'm going to do it"? I, I, that hit my uh, uh, probably my junior year when my junior year. When uh, they they sell, you know, uh, I saw a name in a magazine. You know how you have these different sporting magazines right. of players, uh, positions, and things. And I looked at the magazine, and my name was ranked in the top ten in the country. Wow, that's yeah. pretty impressive. Well, that's, that's, I thought it was also. Not to mention, I, I had I begun getting letters. Uh, from all the NFL teams, saying that, saying that they're watching me. Okay. And uh, yeah, so they were sending me a letter. That's uh, amazing. I mean, were, you, were yeah. you one of these guys that, that sort of you know went and tracked your stats every night? You know, I saw a really interesting documentary. It was um, it was about uh, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, and you know mm -hmm. they had this amazing rivalry. You know, dating back from when they played each other, and Bird was Indiana State, and and Magic was at Michigan State. And, you know, they really hated each other until one day they shot a commercial together. But what was really interesting was that um, Larry Bird said that, that after Magic left the, left the league, he said it wasn't fun anymore. He's like, you know, before that, every night after I played, I would check my stats to see how I measured up to Magic. He said after, after that, it just wasn't any fun anymore. I mean, I had no one to compete against to make me great. So, and you know, I mean, you, and, and I, I think the, the reason the bird checked it was because he was so passionate about being at least as good, if not better than magic. Right. You know, I think that was important, but there are other guys, you know, and I see this probably more in the pros than I do in the, in the, the college ranks where they're so, they're so concerned with their stats. They're like, mm -hmm. they forget they're playing a team sport. Yeah. Well, 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 you know, uh, college football, you know, there's a, a magazine that comes out, uh, Every two or three weeks, I think sporting news, college football, and and magazines like that. And what they're doing is they're they're uh, uh, talking about who are the best players in the country, you know, who who uh, they think is going to uh, go to the NFL, uh, who's the best at, at, at certain positions. And and I always just wanted to, wanted to check and compare where I was. Compared to these other guys who went to these major universities, to the big school, right? And uh, yeah, and I and, and uh, I was always at tip, so I knew then, you know, that's, that wasn't too bad, you know, being being a uh, tip in the United States as far as you know my position. Right. I mean, were there were there other guys that you know that you either the played your position where you where you might say, hey, you know that. I think that guy's a great player, and if I'm measuring up to him, I'm doing something right. Yeah, uh, there was a guy named Reese McCall. Reese played at uh, Auburn. Um, a guy named Mark Bramer. Mark played for the for Michigan, Michigan State. Um, and there, there were about four players that came from major big schools, and uh, you know, and I, you know, and when they compared me to those guys, or if I was ten behind those guys, I'd be pretty damn good. And, and to top it off. Now, my senior year, I was invited to play in, in the senior bowl, college senior bowl, which is the best of the is, best in college, right? 
the best in college, exactly. I was I was invited to play a play the bowl in Mobile, Alabama, where I was there with the best in the country. That's that's yeah, a, we, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah uh, Mark Malone, guys like that. Uh, 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 just just miss a few. Uh, uh, the quarterback for Brigham Young, I can't think of his name. Uh, played for the Raiders. Mark Wilson, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, uh, who else? Uh, Steve Bradley, uh, Mark, it's a bunch of guys. You know, to make a long story short, that's where you go there and you get your official first paycheck because you, you're paid to play in a bowl game. Wow, okay. I don't know. Do they still yeah. do that now? Because I mean, you have all yeah. these NCAA yeah. regulations. No, 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 no. no you, you still get paid. That's the, that's the first, uh, first paycheck. Wow. Uh-huh. So, yeah. so when you think back to your college career, was there any like one game you say, "Wow, that was the standout game"? Oh God, yeah. Which oh, one? Yeah. Which game? For for me, uh, the standout game was my senior year. We were playing uh, UT Chattanooga uh, in Nashville, and I think I had uh, uh, ten catches for 180 yards. Uh, and and other games, you know, I. I remember playing, we were playing in school at Alabama a and where on the opening opening play, I caught a city-yard bomb. Uh, so it was it was me again where I, uh, I think that uh, I, I stood out and shine. Wow. What about sta- yeah. what about stadiums? Was there, was there one stadium that you played in that you just were like, wow, you know? Um, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, we played in Vegas. Vegas had a nice stadium. Vegas, okay. Las Vegas. We played in Memphis. This stadium was really nice, also. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you ever experience and, a really and, crazy hostile crowd? You're like, I'm never coming back here again. Oh well, yeah. You know what? When you when you when you go to schools uh, like uh, Grambling, Southern schools like that, yeah, the fans are kind of crazy. But <laughs> I'll tell you what, Mark, I have never seen any more crazy fans than the ones in the NFL. Those fans are crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. You talk to you, you talk about throwing batteries, throwing beer at you, throwing everything at you when you come out of the locker room, man. That's unbelievable. That's crazy stuff. So, so when you when you said to yourself, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna play in the NFL, I'm gonna play professional. Was there a team that you really wanted to play for? Because you know, maybe you grew up with. Yeah. Who would you want to yeah. play for? The Raiders. You want to play for the Raiders? Yeah. Why? Yeah, why, why do you think you had a thing for the I, Raiders? And the Raiders, because they, the Raiders, they were known for kicking your ass. You know, they were aggressive, uh, very physical, and didn't take any crap, man. And you, I think they you were, like that. I mean, you said at the beginning, right? I, you like that. Yeah, That's what you like. You like, like the physicality I mean, yeah, of the man, game. They're an in-your-face kind of team, man. I love that, man. I yeah. love it. And, and plus, I love Al Davis. He's a hell of a coach. Yeah, what did he used to say? The other side's quarterback must go down, and he must go down hard. <laughs> Yeah, and then he always say, "Just win, baby. Just win." Just win, baby. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, so, how, how does how does how is so you got drafted in what year? Seventy six. Am I right about eighty? Eighty. Eighty. 80. Okay. So, uh-huh. so what, it, it, yeah. what's it like it, getting it, drafted in eighty? What? Say compared to what it is today, because today it seems what? like I mean it almost it's a crazy thing when I watch that the, the whole well, draft. Mark, well, Mark, here's the thing about it. I wasn't even drafted, Mark. I started the free agent. Okay, so how did that happen? You're in the top ten in, in the country in your position. Off. How'd that happen? And, and, you know, see, see, we skipped a lot of stuff. All right, so you got to help me with that. Okay, uh, remember I told you that I played in the Senior Bowl. Right. Okay. In Mobile, Alabama, I went to Mobile, Alabama, and I was roommate with Joe Cribs. And I don't know who Joe I, Cribs I, is. So you're gonna have to educate me a little bit. Joe, Joe Cribs, he was a first round running back out of the University of Auburn. The way he played for the Buffalo Bills. Okay. Yeah. You got, you got to remember the boat that brought me here didn't arrive to '87, so I'm a little behind the times. I was still some skinny kid in England playing soccer. All right, so I'm going to plead ignorance but, on some of this stuff. So excuse so, me. Yeah, yeah, but Joe, you know, he's a great running back. And anyway, I got there and uh, I started. Uh, I met this guy, not even a player, and he was an agent who wanted to represent me, so he invited me to go out with him. After practice, I went out, started drinking beer. Next thing I know is he introduced me to some hashish. I think that's what it's called. Where you smoke it. And is, is this before the draft? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this, is, this is a senior bowl. Okay. The Got it. Okay. Senior bowl. 
we, we can see though. And I went out with him, and when I get when I, and when I came back in, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and all the scouts were like uh, birds on a banister, looking to see who came in late at night. Okay, so came in, so let me, me get this. You're, you're at the senior bowl. You meet Joe Cribs. And you guys uh, go out. You, you not Joe. There's, you know, Joe's my roommate. I met this guy who's agent. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and, Joe, Joe's my roommate, but the other guy was just an agent who went to represent me. All right. So you go out. You party till two in the morning. You were smoking weed, drinking. Yeah, you come yeah. in. The the I guess the coaches or the was it the coaches were all sort of. Yeah. So coaches and scouts. Okay. Yeah, they were all all up seeing who was coming in late at night. Right. They, they want to know who's who's out to party and who's who's here to be serious. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. You come in, you're truly not one night, but three nights in a row. Okay. Yep. Three freaking nights. Okay. So how were you able to yeah. practice? I was young, just young and in great shape. Okay. Yeah. So I went out to the idea my thing, and then uh, uh, after the draft, I mean, they prior to the draft, uh, the Green Bay Packers called me. And asked me where I was going to be, you know, everything, because, you know, they're interested in hell. The draft started at 8 o'clock that morning. I didn't get a phone call, period, that day. And it went, I think, seven rounds the first day. And then it went 12 rounds, up to 12 rounds the second day. No one called me. No one. So my phone started ringing from reporters asking me a question. Well, what happened back down? You're, you're ranked in the top 10. Certainly you should have been drafted. What's going on? And I didn't have a comment. So I said, I don't know. So I left college and went home uh, with, my parent, with my parents. And uh, I never get the very next, I went home and the very next day I was mowing my parents' yard. And my mom came out and told me that I had a phone call. It was Coach Merritt. He wanted, he wanted to talk to me. So I, I got a question here. Let me just back, stop you for a second. This, yes. is, this is fun stuff. So, I mean, you don't get drafted. I mean, you're, mm -hmm probably the top 10, you know, yeah. in the top 10 of tight end slash receivers yeah. in the country, you don't get drafted. You got, you, you got home. I mean, you're mowing your parents' lawn. You must, I mean, at that point, you must have been thinking, okay, I'm done. I mean, that's it. Call, yeah. Football's over. Course, no more. Of course. Of course. And what I, am I going to do I, with the rest of my I, life? Exactly. Of course. Exactly. But my, my word, exactly. In the very next, I mean, the very next day, I went, you know, I, I was at home, mowing my parents' yard. So I didn't want to, I was embarrassed because I knew the media was trying to find me. Everybody wanted to call and ask questions. So Coach Mary called my mom and, and, and told, told her to put me on the phone. He got me on the phone, and he said, uh, baby, the Cleveland Browns want to sign you. He said, I've always, wor I've always worked on the Star Trek situation. Wow. That's okay, Coach. That's okay, Coach. No problem. And, and five minutes later, after I hung up, the Cleveland Browns called me. And told me that they were going to fly me in, in the Cleveland the very next day. So who so who, who called you from the Browns? Chip Chip Valadine. And who's Chip? Chip was like a player relations for okay. the Browns. So uh -huh. I, you, I mean, you must have been beside yourself. I mean, you're like, well, it's I, like I, at the well, jackpot. You, know, you must have been deliriously I, happy. I, I mean, was, I was I was I was extremely happy, and and, and the top it off, you know, this is going to top it off. And and when he said. uh, you know, uh, the flight leaves at a certain time. And guess who picked me up at the airport? Who picked you up? Paul Warfield. Okay. So tell us who Paul, Paul I've heard the name, but tell us, tell everybody else uh, who that is. Oh, Paul, Paul, Hall of Famer, uh, uh, one of the original Cleveland Browns, played for the uh, Miami Dolphins, Cleveland Browns, Miami Dolphins. He, at that time, he was president of the Cleveland Browns. And okay. Paul, picked, Paul picked me up at the airport, and I'll never forget it. And he said, he said, Matt, we think you can make our ball club, and that's why we want to sign you. So he went to the facility. I signed a contract, and and uh, the rookies were going to start work out the next day. So they took to the hotel and everything. I came out the next day and uh, started working out with the rookies. And not just two my own horn, not, not just two my own horn no more, but hey. Two the way, baby. Let's go. Hey, baby, I showed my ass. You know, you know, it was like it was like taking candy for a baby, man. You know, for what they wanted me to do. I mean, you know, I I came from hard knocks, brother. I you know, I could cut on a dime and give you no change. 
catch a BB and catch a BB at night, brother. You know, you name it. Right. You name it. You name it. I was doing it, brother. I love it. And, I love and, it, man. And here's and here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. The rookie stayed there for three days, right? And they and, and they came to me as we we're going on. They said, "No, McDonald, we we want you to stay here and work out with the veteran, because the veteran will come in the next week." So they put me up in a hotel and wanted to see me work out with the veteran. That's that's so, unbelievable. So I want to know some. Did, so you know, look, look, the guys today. I mean, they're making unbelievable yeah. amounts of money. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. are you able to give us? Yeah. I mean, what what what's a rookie you know from Tennessee State making the first year in the well, NFL? Back then, I made thirty thousand dollars. Wow. Okay. So it sounds like what I made when I was prosecutor, right out of law school. In fact, I think you were making yeah. more than me. Thirty thousand dollars. I'm what? a lawyer. I'm living at home with my parents. And they gave me a five hundred dollars Saturday morning. Five hundred. Wow. Okay, so you you will live in large. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, brother. High on the hog. Wow. Well, so so I want to know something. Your parents. I mean, your parents had to be. I mean, they had to be incredibly proud of you. I mean, here's your dad, oh, Jeff Crawford. Your mom oh, was a stay home, oh, and your son's playing the NFL. Yeah, exactly. But but here's a kicker. This to blow your mind. My rookie year, you know, we we uh, got the name Cardiac Kids. I have heard that yeah. name. Were you one of the Cardiac Kids? Exactly. You got to do the research there. Cardiac Kids. And, and, and I would tell you how we got the name Cardiac Kids. Because we won six out of the last seven games in less than a minute. And the, fa- the clean around fans said, these guys are going to cause us to have a heart attack. So <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. So Sounds like my Wolverines. Is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's how we got the name Cardiac Kids. But but yeah, you know, I've got to tell you a story about my, my my mother and father. Okay. We uh, it was forty zero zero in Cleveland. We, we made the playoffs. My parents had never flown before a day in their life. I flew my parents up to the game. Went out, bought bought them all kind of accessories, stay warm and everything. We had to stay in my house, and and I took my dad down to the locker room. He met all the players, but it was still it, it was such a treat. To be able to, to fly, but it's the first time my parents ever flown, ever. That must have been incredible for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. First time ever flown. Wow. Yeah. And, and so you know what's interesting when we're talking about the Cleveland Browns, we're talking about the original Cleveland Browns, not the Cleveland Browns I, that became the brother, Baltimore Ravens. We, and, brother, the, and then you have the, right. Hey, so, hey, we are the original brother. Right. The original, yeah, exactly. Wow. So, so who was the coach? Ah, uh, Sam Tigrano. Who was it? Sam Rotigliano. Okay. What about the who was yeah. your who was your quarterback? Uh, Brian Sipe. Okay. So, yeah, Brian Sipe. As a matter of fact, Brian Sipe got most valuable player my rookie year in the NFL. Wow. So I mean, how was your rookie? You had did you have a great year? I, well, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, you know, I, I played with Harold Ozzie Newsom, and and uh, Sam, you know, and Sam said the, the, the reporters asked Sam, "Well, if anything happened to Ozzie, you know, uh, he said, well." I would have no no problem putting McDonald in at all. So uh, I was on all the special teams show yard, but yeah, I was back at the Aussie. So I must be able to do something right. You must be doing something right. So yeah. so let's talk about the substance abuse issue because when 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 because I know that at some point, right, you went from smoking a little weed and drinking, you know, with the boys in college and even at the uh, the senior ball and th- but that at some point things escalated, right? Yes. yes so tell yes. us about uh-huh. that. Um, that began, uh, really my, uh, second year at Cleveland. Okay. That's when I, that's when I was introduced to, uh, cocaine. Okay. And, uh, T- tell us about the and, circumstances of that. Well, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I, was, I wanted to fit in. You tell a little small town such a boy. And, uh, uh, there were guys there, uh, who had won the Heisman Trophy and big name guys who were doing it. So I wanted to fit in. And go to parties, you know, I felt more uh, confident and comfortable around the girls. You know, the girls were doing it. So it was just, see, like, went hand in hand. And uh, and I, I didn't cross the, even though I did it, I didn't cross that line. I didn't cross that oh, line. Okay, what do you mean by that? Like, what, I, is there a line? I mean, tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, the, the line, that's what I said, the line, the line between um, recreation, recreational and then habitual. I didn't, for me, I, I didn't cross the line until my, after my second year in Cleveland. Okay. And that's when, that's when it got bad. So, 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 so how, 
So how often is this happening? How I mean, is it just after every game? I mean, is it during the week? Uh, no, it, it's after practice every day. Wow. Okay. So I yeah, mean, it, is this going on inside the locker room? Where's it happening? Yeah, well, well, you now uh, sometimes, sometimes a, a game. I can remember. Uh, hold on. You know what, Mark? Let me rush the bathroom. Okay, hold on. All right. We're gonna hold uh, on for you. All right, bro. All right, everybody, we're taking a bathroom break. Welcome to Facebook Live. <laughs> Big Mac's taking a bathroom break. He is, uh, he's a really fascinating guy. And I, I'm going to tell everybody that, quite frankly, we had a, we had a devil of a time getting, getting uh, Big Mac on the show because uh, uh, between him and me, we couldn't figure out how to, how to get him on Facebook Live with Zoom. So a lot of the stuff that you're hearing, I'm hearing it for, to, for the first time too. And uh, he's just a... When I saw him speak, I have to tell you, I mean, he had he had the whole room in tears. He's just an um, he's just an unbelievable human being. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to share this stuff with you. And um, there's some other guys uh, who were in that room too, uh, who hopefully we're going to okay, get on the show. You back, Big oh. Mac? Yeah, I'm back, brother. Hey, listen, uh -huh. man. You know, listen. At our age, when you got to go, you got to go. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm 51, and I know when I got to go, I'm yeah, going. I got it. I gotta go, brother. Still good. <laughs> Listen, I bet yeah. I bet you could still do a sub five forty when you gotta go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> yeah, brother. <laughs> You're right, bro. <laughs> Listen, even I. Listen, I know when I gotta go to the bathroom, I can run a sub five forty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, brother. So, uh, so, so let's back up a second because you were telling us that you know it became a bit of a problem and it was happening after every practice and some of it was going on in the locker room. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yes, and, and, and you know, my story is there's a book, and you might want to do this. There's a book called The Unsto Untold Stories of the Cardiac Kids. Don Karkoff, he, he's the author of it. And, and, and there's a lot, a lot of light shed on everybody in that book. Okay. Are you, are you, are you presuming you're part of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah they got, as a matter of fact, they got a whole chapter of me in their pictures and everything. Okay. All yeah, right. Let's get yeah. the untold uh, the untold story of the car cardiac kid is dark car problem. I love it. So I mean, you know, it's interesting. I've had other other football players come on and they tell me about how they were doing coke, and yet they play they still play great. They didn't miss practice. They worked out. I mean, literally, it it how do I even say well, this? See, it it was almost like it morphed into 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 their everyday life, but yet somehow they still functioned on an unbelievable well, level. I mean, you're well, in the NFL. It's the best well, of the best. I know, but you know, you know what, uh, Mark? I, I tell you what, I, I, I think I not think I know when I crossed the line because I I stopped snorting cocaine. I started smoking. That's a whole different beast. It's called free basic. Right. You're not snorting it. You're free basing it, meaning you're smoking it. That was a total different beast. And you, 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 you're talking about myself and a few other players. We would get out of practice and start smoking. At four o'clock, and would it wouldn't stop smoking till uh, six o'clock that morning. And we had to be in practice at nine o'clock. I mean, how, how are you able to do it? Huh, come on, man. Huh. After, hey, you just, you just go. You, your performance starts going down. Okay. Your yeah. performance goes down. I don't give a damn who you are. There's no way in the hell you're gonna stay up. Uh, that many hours smoking. Uh, Even cocaine. if you weren't smoking, just the lack of sleep probably would have, you know, would have exactly. had to wreck you. I can't remember. Well, I'll give you an example of myself. There were several times myself and other players, I don't call their names, we would go in a meeting, and as soon as the lights went out, bang, you're asleep. We were, yeah, we, we would literally start snoring in the meeting. Wow. So, uh, yeah. At some point, did the coaches start noticing your performance was, was deteriorating? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought was, I went to the Cleveland Browns. Uh, Carl Eller. I don't, I don't know if you know Carl Eller. Carl Eller was one of the purple people that played for the Minnesota Vikings. He played for Bud Grant. Carl Eller, uh, they went to four Super Bowls and didn't win one. They lost four Super Bowls. But Carl, at that time, Carl was working for the NFL. And Carl... When he played football, he had a serious drug problem. So the, the NFL had hired Carl to go around to all the teams and tell, start telling his story to all the teams. And when Carl came to the Cleveland Browns, after Carl told his story, and, and I'll tell you what, he touched me so much, 
could I could relate to him. You know what? I said, I said, Carl, I need to talk to you. And I talked to the Carolina drug problem, and we went down to Sam's office that same day. And I went in with Carl beside me and told Sam I had a drug problem. And they sent me to um, Minnesota the next day for treatment. Okay, so I want I want to back up because I'm looking at I'm looking at the profile that you had from from the um that summit, and it says stuff in here that you were, there was there was even guys doing coke on the sideline. Is that right? Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah I, I did it. You were doing coke on the sideline. Yeah, I, but you know, I had a, I had an eight ball of cocaine in my sock in a game we were playing the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, it, 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 you know, you know, tops it off. I had some friends who played for the Packers. Before the game that that Saturday, that Friday night, I went to the hotel room, up, up the hotel room, and we had a quarter ounce thrown in about five of the Packers and myself. That's crazy, Matt Big Mac. That's crazy stuff. I, and you know, I'm not saying these things like I'm proud of it. Not at all. Yeah, no, no, no. And I and I know that you're not. And I know that you you have um, been very yeah. gracious to share this stuff yeah. with us. So I and I I don't make light of it. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously we want. The whole point of you coming on the show is to hopefully motivate some people to, to you know, to make changes. So I, right, I, I appreciate right. you sharing I this stuff. So. We're not making, so, no, this isn't funny stuff. I mean, we, right. we're, we're having fun because, I mean, I'm enjoying you as a guest, but this right. is serious stuff. And so, right. um, okay, so so you ended up, who sent you to treatment? The Cleveland Browns. The, the Cleveland Browns sent you. So when, when was that? Was that after the off season? <laughs> I'm not, uh, yeah, 1981. I went to uh, Minnesota, I went to St. Mary's. Okay, how long are you in treatment for? 30 days. 30 days, okay, so you come back. I had to I had to call Sam, and he wanted me to call him every day. I call him every day, uh, and I come back. I come back, Ozzy and Calvin Hill picked me up at the, at the airport. Uh, they took me out to dinner, we, we talked, they asked how I was doing, we talked and everything, and, I, and uh, I guess it wasn't two months later, I was back out there again, doing it again. So how long did you stay clean for? Probably about three months. Okay, why do you think you went back? Uh, the lifestyle. Okay. I was you know, lifestyle. I wasn't ready. You know what? A market just wasn't ready. You know, women. I, 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 you know, the women and 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 situations that I put my stuff in. I just wasn't ready. Yeah, I hadn't. I hadn't really hit my bottom yet. Okay. So, so how much, how much long did you play, play uh, for the Browns? I played, I played, I played a total of three years. I played one more year as a Brown, which was three years, and then uh, I'll never get it. I felt uh, to see that when I came back, the Browns had me take random drug testing, and I, I must have failed a total of probably six or seven drug tests, and they still kept giving me chances. Why do you think that was? Because, uh, first of all, because uh, Art Modell and Sam Tegala were hell of a, they're hell of a people. They're good people. And they wanted, they wanted to see me get it. And, but they wanted this last turn around, I'll see what happened. The last turn around, I uh, fell a drug test and Sam said, well, you know, I can't do it no more, man. I can't do it no more. And he released me. Wow. So And, 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 and this is going to blow your head off. A week later, you remember the United States football football league? Yeah, football? that was the, they got Herschel Walker to come over. No, am I right about yeah. that? Yeah. So I'm at home. I get a call, a call uh, from Jim Garrett, who was my Jim Garrett. Uh, was was that um, was that the league that Trump was involved in? Yes. Right. Yeah, he he yeah. wanted to take on the NFL, so he started his it's, own league, USFL, it's, and it's, they got Herschel to come over. He sued for a more dollar exactly, but but anyway. Uh, Jim Garrett, who, who he was the running back coach for Cleveland, he called me. He said, "Matt, who do you want? To, who do you want to go play for?" And remember, I told you I, I want to play for the Raiders. Remember right, that? right. He called Al Davis and told Al Davis about my problem and what a great player I was. Al called me personally on the phone. Said, "McDonald, come out here and work out for us." So they flew me to L.A., worked me out. I did a hell of a job working out there. Work, I, I bust my ass working out for him. And then come back to Cleveland. And then I was scheduled to fly out to L.A. on a Thursday and sign a contract for the Raiders. Okay. So it had to be a dream come true, right? You're going to get played for the well, Raiders? <laughs> listen, listen to this. 
I get a call that Wednesday from the Michigan Panthers in the USFL. They offer me an astronomical amount of money guaranteed if I tell them you have the late for Carolina Bills. So what they were doing was getting former NFL players right. to try to come over to their league, give them credibility. To make a long story short, uh, the Raiders couldn't match the money that Mr. Panther were going to pay me, guaranteed money. So I was scheduled to fly out to L.A. on a Thursday. Then Wednesday, I drove, and at that Thursday morning, I drove to uh, Michigan and signed a contract. Okay. Yeah, so. and, 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 I mean, I'll tell you what, Mark, you tell my, tell my money, I had lots of money now. These, these guys gave me lots of money. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. I, I want to know, were you, were you a married guy, still single guy back then? Single, yeah, single. Single guy. Okay, oh, yeah. so it's just you, yourself, yeah. and I, right? I mean, yeah, it, and, a, and a ton of dough and a drug habit. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I went to I went to Michigan. Uh, my, I went there. My my first year there, we won a we won a championship. My first year. Where, where did you guys play play your ball? Because you know I went to, I did my other guy at University of Michigan. Did you play a Syracuse. Okay. Yeah. Got it. In Detroit. It's, yeah. It, uh, it, it's in Bluefield. A Got it. The, sil- yeah. the Silver Dome. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Me, they, uh, I, I, it was me, Bobby A. Bear, Anthony Carter. Uh, AC. I, I well, yeah, Anthony AC, Carter yeah. played. Is that Anthony Carter that played at Michigan, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 We we all played together uh, down there at Michigan, and, and we won the championship. And and then to tell you this, to tell you what happened after my my first year with Michigan, old habits are hard to break. So. Well, were you were you clean the first year you were there? No. No. Okay. So we still no. use it. Yeah, I'm still, still using it. I have all kind of money. So, so uh, what happened was uh, after uh, the season was over, I come back to Cleveland. You know, I still have a place there, and, and I'm still using it in Cleveland, but I'm playing with the Michigan Panthers. So finally, training camp comes around, and uh, uh, me and Jim Stanley, who was the who was the who was the head coach? Bumps head. He was a, to me. He was a redneck. He, <laughs> he, he, he was a redneck. See, I, I came from a program me away. You know, the NFL is totally different than than the league they're playing. And he liked me, and I didn't like him because uh, 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 they gave me all the money. And then you know, me and my receiver coach, we couldn't get along at all. He didn't want me there. So. <laughs> You know what I did? I boycotted. I boy, I wasn't going to practice. You boycotted. Okay. So yep. you, you didn't go to practice. I, nope. I didn't go to practice. Okay. So, so, so I want to know something. You know, I want to know something. I want to back up a second. What's, yeah. what was the, what's the big difference between college and the NFL? You know, and I asked this question oh, to Randy Grimes, oh, and he gave me an interesting answer. Oh, brother. The speed and strength. Right. A player. That's speed. Speed is fit the players. Yeah, you know that's kind of what Randy said when I asked him that. He, he said to me when I asked when I asked Randy Grimes, you know, I said, "What's the difference between college and uh, the NFL?" He said, "They hit harder." Oh yeah, they yeah. hit harder. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. he played ten it, years it, at center, it, so he was getting it, hit in every play. And they're faster and stronger. Yeah, that, that yeah. Was, and, that, that's what he said. Yeah. And, and you know, the good part about it, well, you know, you know, sometimes playing college. You might go against somebody who's a rinky dick, or you know that they, they can really go out dogging. When you reach that end level, everybody's a professional. You ain't go against no, nobody who ain't worth the shit. You know that's why he's a professional. So you got to be at your best at all times. Yep. So yep. so how how the NFL compared to the USFL? Uh, uh, it wasn't the, the USFL had talent. Certain certain teams had talent. Now the team I was on this year. Michigan, we had Michigan and Philadelphia. We had more talent than any a team in the USFL because we had uh, we were comprised of more NFL players, players who left the NFL and, and came and played with us. You know, talk about the money. I know for us to give example uh, at uh, Michigan, we had five guys from the Pittsburgh Steelers, four guys from the Cleveland, Cleveland Browns that, that that were on the team. Okay, and we all had that experience. And and Philadelphia had had a lot of former former NFL players that came over there also. So, but as far as overall talent, 
uh, the overall talent wasn't there uh, as you have the NFL, but uh, but uh, Michigan and Philadelphia they stood out. Okay, so how long did you end up playing for USFL? Two years. So you spent two years I love, there. Two, I love I love Michigan Academy. Michigan Academy and paid me. still paid me all their money, and then uh, Washington picked me up. Washington Federals, which sucked. They were horrible. Okay, why is that? They were horrible. The team was just bad. The team was horrible. Yeah, the team was horrible. And, and, and I had, I think, the, uh, we were one in one in fifteen. When I got there, uh, uh, they had just lost uh, about four games. So I was there for twelve games. It was, it was so bad. This coach wanted to practice three hours, and I said, Coach, you know what? I said I can't practice three hours. That, it doesn't make sense. You know, keep you know, these guys keep losing, and then keep out there three hours. You know, your mind can only absorb what you see the lectures. And after three hours, you know what? You're dead. Well, also, so, you were you were somewhat of a seasoned vet. You didn't need three hours of practice. You know what I mean? He 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 liked me. He liked, he didn't like me saying that. You know, because he because he there are there are a lot of these young college kids who are just glad to be there. You know what I mean? Right. And and and, and my son and field players. You know what? We, we knew that you, you don't have to practice that long. So, needless, needless to say, as the season over, they cut me, it was over. So, it was all over. So, that's it. Done with football. Yes. Done with football. Okay. So, so where does your life go from there? Because, you know. You oh, know. God. You know what, Mark? Uh, it would take it, it would take forever. All right. Well, we only have, we don't have, I wish we had forever because I can sit and talk to you because no. you're a fascinating <laughs> guy. We might no, have to bring I you back on. But I know, I know at some point, and that was sort of the crux of what, what I, you know, was, uh-huh. was so passionate about your story and what really moved me and everybody else who was in the audience. I know at some point you hit rock bottom, right? I mean, you just, right. you were, so tell me, what, tell me, tell us about that, when that happened. Okay. Uh, that happened uh, about, I want to say, eight years ago. Um, I uh, had ran out of money, uh, and I, I called the, uh, uh, the, the NFL Players Association, and they sent me to uh, uh, treatment in Miami. Okay, so I, I want to know something. You, you, so eight years ago, so how long? How long after you got out of the league? How long were you were you continue to use for? It, I, I, every day. I mean, how many years I, are we talking about? I, I got out of I, I got out of the league in uh, eighty five. So you're talking up until. Eight years? I got four years playing now. Twelve, so, so twelve years ago. You're talking about until 2004, yeah. uh, uh, 2006. Uh, four, four, 14. What, 18 years, 2014. So you said you've been yeah. clean, you, you've been, you, four years. I, you I, went into treatment, you, you said you've been clean four, right? Uh-huh. Plus mm-hmm. there were eight years, am I right about yeah. that? Did I get the math right? Yeah, but, 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 but see, I was, I would get clean, if they clean for, for a month, uh, two here and there, and, and get money, get up to my feet, and I was going right back out there, start all over again. So it sounds like you were going, there was a thing you it sounds like still like twenty years where you were just. Well, I've been. It's a total. You know, Mark. I tell you what, it's 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 been damn near twenty years, man. I'm telling you, man. I you know what? When Randy met when when uh, I, I'll tell you what. I was in Miami, homeless in Miami, Florida, homeless, and um. I just give him my. When, well, let me ask you a question. When you say homeless, tell us what you, you describe that first, because it's because in Florida, you know, we see homeless people, but it's hard to imagine a guy who played in the NFL as you know homeless. Okay. Tell us okay. what that means. Okay, that homeless for me was I I had my car, I had, I had a Land Rover, okay, and I had been over this uh, girl in your house smoking crack. I I didn't have it. I was just living in my car basically, and. Uh, this guy, I let him use my car to go for a crack. Okay, the car uh, got impounded, and the girl put me out of the apartment in the rain in Miami. In the rain, I had nowhere to go, so I called the cops. What about personal you possessions? Know, Do you have any personal possessions? Uh, not, not anything about that thing. No, I think I had some sweatpants on. Sweatpants on and a t-shirt or something like that, but no, no. I think I think I, I had a suitcase in my vehicle. Okay. And uh, and that was gone because uh, the car got yeah, impounded. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, so my 
car got impounded and then the girl put me out of the apartment. So I called uh, the, the police and they, they came and I said, I look, man, I need somewhere to go. So they came and picked me up and took me to the, I never get to, took me to some road. I don't know where in the, it was in the rain and told me to get out. They, the, so swear, the cops picked you out and they dumped you on the side of the street somewhere. Yeah. Swear to God. Do you have any money on you? Out. Did you have any money? No. No. Nothing. No. Basically, nothing. the clothes you were wearing. That's it. Yeah, I, I smoked it all up. But to talk about, okay, I was walking in the rain, so I walked to this convenience store, and and I, I and I started thinking, well, I got to do something. I went inside there and faked a heart attack, so that so that they would call an ambulance to come pick me up and take me to the hospital, so that I would have somewhere to go that night. Did you get to the come to the the ambulance come? Yeah. Uh-huh. The ambulance came and picked me up, took me to Miami, took me to Miami hospital. I stayed there almost uh, all day long until Friday. They said, you know, we can't find anything wrong with your heart. You know, okay. what's going on? And, and the doctor said, uh, I said, Doc, you know what? There's nothing going on with my heart. I'm just, I'm homeless. I don't have where to go. He said, okay. He said, okay, just wait a minute. And that's when he called this uh, shelter, and, and they took me to the shelter. And I uh, never get man. Go in there and uh, had this hard furniture, hard big hard furniture and everything. Oh man, unbelievable! And uh, and uh, uh, then I spent the night there. And then they took me to another shelter the next day. Where if I went in there, uh, you know, I, I, but somehow I stood out amongst the other people. I don't know why, but I stood out. And 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 the director and a couple therapists said, "Who are you?" Yeah, I told them who I was and what what I did, what I'd done, and they called uh, Dana Lee Han, NFL Care Foundation. Which which foundation? And NFL Care Foundation. NFL Care Foundation. Okay, is yeah. that that exists today? I think right. NFL yeah. Cares. Uh-huh. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So what what and is the, what is the NFL Care Foundation? What do they do? The, the NFL Care Foundation. Uh, they're there to assist former NFL players who uh, have uh, hit. Uh, rough roads, rough uh, knots uh, in the road in terms of financially, medically. Uh, you know, um, a lot. I know a lot of guys who have drug problems, and they'll actually get them in treatment, and they'll pay some bills for them. They won't see you money, period. They'll pay bills, but not. They won't give you the money. So I mean, okay? so you know what it is. So you know, it's people see see the see players on you know on the TV, and they see how much money's being made. And I think people lose sight of the fact that when when the career is over, I mean, your career is over. I mean, all you've ever done since yeah. you were a kid is play football, exactly. and and, exactly. and and you know, sort of everybody else forgets about you. And yeah. yet, they, I mean, I'm thinking we have a, I mean, just based on what you know, the folks we've had on our show, uh-huh. that, I mean, there's a whole, you know, almost like a whole just uh, group of former athletes, not just football players, but athletes in all sports, mm-hmm. who really, I mean. Us are, I mean, they're dealing with issues of addiction and homelessness and, and bankruptcy, yeah. and they're losing yeah. everything. I mean, Daryl Strawberry yeah. told us an unbelievable story about yeah. you know what he lost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right, you're right, man. And uh, but she had uh, someone come pick me up the very next day, uh, and it took me to um, treatment. That's, that's why I met Randy. When I got out, I had a, a pair of sweatpants and a, a brown paper bag. That's it. That's it. So, so did Randy come p- to pick you up? And for those that don't know, Randy yeah. Grimes is is a mutual yeah. friend of ours who works in the treatment mm-hmm. center. Randy was the starting center for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for ten years, mm-hmm. and and, yes. and dealt with his own issues. You know, he came on the right. on, on on the show and talked about his own issues with with good, with pills and stuff. Good, good man, hell of a good. He is a good man. man, and he's hell a man. he's a great. I mean, just as a human being, he's a great man. Yeah, hell of a man. And Randy, see, Randy had uh, just gotten there a day before me. For treatment, for treatment, and uh, and when they brought me in, they had Randy there waiting to see me and talk to me. And he and he suddenly got in the van with a freaking uh, brown paper bag, uh, pair of sweatpants, a t-shirt. Wow. Yep. So how how yep. long were you in? Tra- where where'd you end up going for treatment? Uh, it was uh over at um in in uh, Lakewood uh. Uh, I've got written down here behavior health of the Palm Beaches. Is that, is that the place? That's it. That's okay. it. That's it. Yeah, B, yeah, that's B-Hop. it. B-Hop. B-Hop. Which yeah, doesn't B-Hop. exist. I think it just, they just, uh, they just sold it. Yeah. They just, they just sold it. So, so, yeah. so how long did you go into treatment for? 
I was I was there for almost two months, and, and after getting out of treatment, they gave me a job there. Okay, doing what? I was uh, working with this lady, uh, working with alumni, calling, calling and checking on alumni and things like that, arranging, you know, arranging uh, trips for them if they want to come in and, and attend different functions. Yep. Jack, the owner, Jack, the owner, you know, he, he said, hey, man, I'm going to get a job, and he did it. Yep. Wow. So, so, so tell me what you're doing with your life these days. Cause I mean, you know, you're an inspirational oh, guy. You're, by the way, you're a great public speaker. I mean, <laughs> you had the whole room in tears. I want you to know that. I mean, everybody well, was, was well, incredibly moved. Well, what I'm doing today, I'm, I'm working for Lamira Detox. I'm working in, in a detox center, uh, uh, working, uh, helping people who, who have drugs. Where's, and, where is Lamira? Lamira is located in Jupiter. Hold on a second. What? We're, we're going to find those guys online. Hold on a second. We're going to give them a shout, too, and a bit of a okay. plug, because I think they deserve it. So how do you spell Lemire? Yeah. L-U-M-I-E-R-E. Here we go. Lemire Detox. Who do I know there? Yes. Yes. Great place. All right. Well, let's give out their information. So I think I know Lemire. Why do I know this place? Anyway, so the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give out the website, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, so the, go the, ahead, so it's, it's Lemire Detox sent detoxcenter.com so it's l-u-m-i-e-r-e detoxcenter.com yes. i'm going to give out yes. a phone number too it's 855-535-8501 that's 855-535-8501 and i'll see if i can find an address for them where are they where are they located the, 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 the address is 250 there you go thelma t-e-t-h-e-l-m-a thelma avenue okay this is this is jupiter florida Okay. How do, how do you, how how are things for you personally? I mean, are, are you uh, are you having a great life? I mean, oh man, I, you know what, Mark, I'm living a dream, man. I I'm living a dream, and you know right. my my life is it's my life. Has I been, love it. My life has never been so good, man. I you love know, it. I'm I'm, a, I'm surrounded with great people, and uh, and my family they're back in my life, and I call my dad's 89 years old, and I call him every night. So things are going wonderful. Well, I'm sure they're proud of you because it's been one hell of a ride for you, you know? <laughs> I still think, you know what? What was the, what was the term you used at the beginning when I said, you know, you were telling me about how you, you could still, you could turn on a dime, you didn't leave no change? Yeah, yeah, See, yeah, I still yeah. think, I still don't think you're leaving any change. That's what it is. Just, just a different, just a different type of route. No more skinny posts. I like that. I like that, brother. Right? Very good. <laughs> you, you, you're still leaving them, still leaving them in your shadow. <laughs> my brother i'm really I, I can't thank you enough for coming on to share your story Man, i really um you, appreciate you, before we go i'm going to give out my information and okay. if that's if anybody wants to contact us a drug and alcohol attorneys and talk about what we do or maybe they want to get more information about what uh, big mac is doing at lumiere they should reach out to us so let me give out my uh, my website which is drug and alcohol attorneys.com drug and alcohol attorneys.com and folks can email me at mark at drug and alcohol attorneys.com. So it's M A R K, or they can just call us 561 419 6095. 561 419 6095. Wow, I gotta tell you, this was a great show. And considering we didn't spend a lot of time prepping for it, we had a lot of fun, right? <laughs> I loved it, brother. I had a great time. It was great. It was great. great All right, time, listen, Mark. Great thank time. you. Thanks very much for coming on to, to um, thank you for to share your me. story. Hey, look, if you need me, just give me a call, okay? You're my guy. So listen, don't go anywhere. Hold on a second. I'm going to disconnect us from Facebook, and then I just want to chat with you for a minute, okay? Hold on okay. a second, okay? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.